Hi. Hi there. Well, thank you for that very warm welcome, and thanks especially to the uh, to Mark and the Iwi uh, representatives for your warm welcome. Um, we're going to uh, share some of our experiences, and uh, the goal here, obviously, is to brainstorm how the uh, New Zealand economy can transition to its uh, carbon emissions targets to help save the world and lead by example. And it's a, it's a bit of a daunting task because we have to go uh, to 50% of current methane levels and net zero on all other emissions by 2050. And that's going to take all of us working uh, together on that. I'm gonna, uh, I understand that the local uh, Maori practice in uh, Taranaki is to uh, have the women speak first because that makes it uh, less threatening when you come in peace. Uh, but first of all, Susie is as much or more of a warrior than I am. And in any case, we set it up so that I would speak first. And I'm just paralyzed if we don't do that. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll lead off and then she'll, uh, she'll take over in a few minutes uh, with her areas of expertise around, uh, around food. I did speak first. I said hello. Good point. <laughs> oh, good. Good. So it's handled. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to also thank all of you for doing what you're doing here today uh, and, uh, you know, to try to find this solution which is inclusive and fair to all and we would add that can actually stimulate and grow uh, the NZ economy. And uh, the, the purpose of this gathering is to figure out how to future-proof the New Zealand economy in a changing world. So why are we standing up here? Uh, as, you know, to, to, to kick this off. Uh, most people probably know us, uh, know me as an explorer and a filmmaker, know Susie as an actor and an educator. She founded her own uh, schools. Uh, but most of our work actually in the last 10 years has been in agriculture and food. And that has been driven by our environmental concerns. And as we'll uh, show, we'll take you down this path, you can't really talk about reducing emissions in New Zealand without talking about the future of ag and food. So I'm sure most of you would view us as outsiders, but we have actually made New Zealand our home and we're now residents and we're working here and we have businesses here. Um, we fell in love with this place, not just for its beautiful scenery or for its high winds, but for its national spirit, its value system, which is how we wanted our children to be raised. Now, you know, Kiwis tend to be humble, so let us as uh, semi-outsiders brag about you to you just for a second. You have a very can-do spirit. You have a sense of self-reliance. You tend to be very forward-thinking and, and tech-forward. Uh, at the same time, there's a fundamental pragmatism to the way you approach things. You have a strong green consciousness. And uh, that's, of course, especially true in the Maori communities who are, who are so deeply rooted to the land. But everyone here shares that green consciousness. And we believe that if you don't appreciate and love and honor nature, uh, how are you going to fight for that which you don't love and respect? Um, you have a relatively small population as a nation and that allows you to pivot quickly and to react rapidly to global <laughs> economic trends. You're economically agile. That allows you to lead by example uh, in the developing world and that's the developed and developing world and that's, I think that's very important. Um, most importantly, you're <laughs> sane. You're sane people. <laughs> Unlike some other countries that we occasionally live in. <laughs> who are insane, especially on this issue. You know, and these are the values, uh, you know, that's why we're here. And, you know, we want to live here the rest of our lives and continue to raise our children here. This is our home. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, we started coming here, well, I started coming here when Jim was working on Avatar. And I trooped over here with all of the children and within a couple of days we had fallen madly in love with the place and we knew we were going to be coming back to look for a home. We went through the permanent residency process 
And the day that we landed, when we had our permanent residency, the immigration officer said, welcome home. I almost burst into tears. You did. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And we have made New Zealand our home. It feels much more home here than in the States at this point, because you're all sane. <laughs> so anyway, we were all in this together, right? And we really applaud what's happening here today. Um, but, you know, climate change, why do, we, why do we care? I mean, I think everybody here, first of all, New Zealanders are very well informed on, on world affairs. I'm sure you know the answer, but I do think it, it bears at least a minute of, of speaking out loud about this. You know, because, yes, you know, the glaciers are, are melting, and, and yes, the wildland fires are out of control in the United States and Australia and across Europe and so on, and heat waves. But that's not the picture of the future that scares me the most and why I'm, I'm so dedicated to this as a cause. You think about the immigrant crisis in, in Europe that toppled all the liberal governments there uh, over the last few years and set us back in the political dark ages. That was caused by a couple of hundred thousand refugees coming up out of Syria and, and Africa and they were fleeing drought. They were fleeing drought that was caused by historically unprecedented changes to the, to the climate. So what happens to us globally when it's millions and then tens of millions and eventually hundreds of millions of people as, as is being predicted? You know, fleeing farms that have become deserts, uh, fleeing coasts uh, and rising seas that are devouring their fertile deltas and their, their coastal cities. You know, the chaos and the human suffering will be unfathomable and the political outcome will be intolerable. It will be a ruthless future. It will be the end of democracy. It will be the end of peace. And I can't bear to think that we're not doing everything that we can do to not leave that world to our, our children and our grandchildren. And the handwriting is on the wall, uh, you know, about, the, about this kind of dark, you know, uh, political scenario. If you look at the U.S., not only is the government pretending, you know, to, to be utter, pretending to be utterly dismissive of the human role in climate change and that we should do anything about it, but at the very same time, they're building walls, you know, to keep out, they're building a mighty wall to keep out all the immigrants who are fleeing, uh, you know, from, from uh, civil unrest and so on down below. But, you know, this latest wave that set off this big crisis where they had to call out the military to defend the United States was caused by farmers coming up from Guatemala through Central America, through Mexico, to try to find a better life. Why? Because the farms that they had worked for 10 generations have suddenly collapsed due to unprecedented, historically unprecedented drought. It's happening, it's happening now. But this is just a glimpse of the, the future. So what's the solution? This is the first big challenge in human history where all the nations of the world really need to work together. And historically, we're not very good at that. We don't need walls and isolation. We need cooperation. And I think that this is a place where New Zealand can lead by example. I wanna to return to that, to that theme this is a place that can act quickly, that can act sensibly because we're sensible people here and can show the world what, what the solution looks like. So the Paris Accords and the, and the, the carbon targets are very, um, uh, very important. And fortunately, unlike the US, uh, New Zealand is leaning into the problem and actively looking for solutions. And that's hugely important, you know, and uh, uh, Prime Minister, uh, mentioned the zero carbon bill and there's the climate change commission and so on. So they're mapping a path forward and we're doing it here over the next couple of days. So, but how exactly do we meet these all important emission targets? And apparently there's a remote here that will uh, start our slides. And it seems to work. There okay, you go. good. So this shows the various emissions by their various sectors. And what stands out to me is how small electricity generation is, and that's a tribute to how 
uh, to New Zealand's power already, and the fact that you're already, uh, we're already at 85% renewable with hydro and, and wind and so on. So that's fantastic, right? Except that the available delta now is so small in, in electricity generation that it puts a lot of pressure on the other sectors like transportation and agriculture. Transportation is actually a good place for, for uh, a change. Uh, the global average is about 13.5% of total um, greenhouse forcing. Here it's 19.7%. So it's a little above the, the global average. This is a good place to attack, to electrify the vehicle fleet and, and maybe look at some technical innovation, some new engineering around maybe hydrogen fuel cells for long haul trucking and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I'm gonna return to uh, innovation after, after Susie's part of all this. Um, but by far, the biggest section of emissions at 48% is agriculture and animal agriculture is the vast majority of that. Dairy alone accounts for 22%, which is well, well above all transportation combined. So the, the elephant in the room here or the cow in the room here is, is obviously uh, animal agriculture. Now I just wanna say that I know that there are probably a fair few people here that are, that are farmers or work in the agricultural sector or in the related food businesses. And I, I just wanna say we're farmers. You know, we, we have a large working farm in the, in the Wairarapa, south of Featherston. We grow uh, flax, corn, hemp, um, uh, industrial hemp, and uh, <laughs> maybe the other kind in a year or so if things go well in this referendum. Uh, we have a large organic vegetable operation, and we have bees, we have 300 hives, we make some pretty good manuka honey, and uh, we also have organic farms in Canada, in Saskatchewan and, and British Columbia, and we grow veggies there and also uh, yellow peas and lentils and so on. I grew up on a small, family operated uh, mixed farm in Canada and Susie grew up on a farm in uh, in Oklahoma that was a beef beef farm beef and pigs beef and pigs <laughs> so trying to say you know we get it farming is hard it's long hours it's uncertain financially you can have bad harvest markets change weather patterns change you know so we're very sympathetic to farmers especially family owned farms and we know that here in in uh, Taranaki uh, especially, dairy is one of the biggest economic drivers, which is why this conclave is, is being hosted here at, at least as much as because of the, the oil and gas industry here. Um, you know, because dairy is the biggest single greenhouse gas uh, emitter in the New Zealand economy. And so this is where the rubber is gonna meet the road when it comes to change and it's gonna affect a, a lot of people. So I just wanna, you know, applaud for a moment the New Zealand way of doing things, which Susie and I so admire. Instead of hosting this conclave in, you know, in, in Wellington or Auckland or you know, so, so very far from the farm gate, you choose to do it here in the place where uh, you know, the, problem, the, the problem could hit the hardest and that shows compassion and understanding and inclusiveness and that's, that's the Kiwi way and that's one of the value systems that we so admire. Um, and it's a signal, I think, to the, to the community that nobody's gonna be left behind in this transition, that it's gonna be done sensibly, it's gonna be done over time uh, in a way that, that, uh, that benefits everyone. And this is pretty much the opposite of how it's done in the US, where you know, it's, it's all about denial and it's all about divisive party, party politics and all of that sort of thing. So you know, take a moment to be proud of yourselves and have that little bit of an outsider perspective. We can jump you know, we can jump back and forth inside and outside, hopefully, and bring some different perspectives here. You know, the future is coming, whether, whether we like it or not. And we, you know, so we have to shift our consciousness. And, you know, there are alternatives to how things are done now. And hopefully they can be as lucrative, if not more so, if we're smart about it. Um, and, but we have to change. So how do you make that change sensible and inclusive and just for all? You know, so animal ag, we acknowledge, has been a huge part of the New Zealand economy since its inception. It's deeply ingrained in the very fabric of, of life here. And not only is it 
uh, the biggest export sector, but it's also kind of the basis for consumption here. Uh, New Zealanders love their meat and dairy. You know, you eat what you grow. Um, but this has come at a cost. And New Zealanders are among the most at-risk population uh, in, the, in the world, the most at-risk populations in the world for diseases that are known to be the result of eating meat and dairy. And Susie has some stats on that because she's the nutritionist, <laughs> <laughs> among, among many other things. So I don't know if you all know, but New Zealand is number five in heart disease in the world, number five in diabetes, number two in osteoporosis, and number one in bowel cancer in the world. Right, so that's sobering, but the way I look at it is it's kind of a win-win scenario if we can crack the, crack the code on this. Um, and we'll get to later how all of those stats which people are confronting worldwide are causing them to change their consumption habits and how uh, meat and dairy consumption are going down, dairy especially in the US. Um, so let's just go back to the emissions profile for a second. So in other countries, you'd look to ele electrical generation. Uh, that's not going to work here as well, although I think it's important. Transportation, discuss that. Uh, but we really have to look at that, at that agricultural sector. And the, 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 the targets are, are quite ferocious when it comes to methane. Uh, so we've got to cut methane by, by 2050 in half. And methane is a, a, a powerful greenhouse forcing gas, so is nitrous oxide, uh, although on a shorter timetable, time, time uh, half-life than, than carbon dioxide. Uh, but these numbers, I believe, are carbon dioxide equivalent numbers. So they're, it's an apples to apples. So 48% of emissions from an industry that, uh, that is only generating uh, about 5% of New Zealand's uh, GDP. And of course, that ag sector also supports about another 4% from the food and beverage industries. So call it a total of 9%. So there is a disproportion there. And so, you know, in, in purely objective terms, not unemotional terms, you know, less, less ag, uh, and certainly far less animal ag is the, is the best way to retool the, the emissions profile of, of the country. So uh, now we know that GDP isn't the full story because it's, you know, ag and food are 37% are of exports. So that has, to be, that has to be factored in. So uh, let's see. So the, here are the emissions goals. 5% uh, by 2020, that's looming. 2030, 30% uh, below uh, 2005, 11% uh, below 1990. And 2050, the current target is 50% below on methane, but it's zero emissions in all other areas, net zero. So these are, these are pretty daunting numbers. So how do we reduce these animal emissions? Oh, you wanted to? Oh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to um, mention too, you know, the, the prime minister actually talked about urgency. The UN announced about six months ago the IPCC report. We have until 2030 to turn things around. So there really is an urgency in doing something now. So here's an interesting slide, and Susie can speak to this as well as I can. But if you look at the carbon emissions produced by different sectors of agriculture, uh, a quick glance shows you that if you're eating more to the right of the curve, you're doing less damage than if you're eating to the, to the left of the curve. Um, and by by uh, quite a, an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude in, in some case. Um, so, you know, we can reduce methane at the animal and there's research being done on that. That's good for with low methane production feedstocks and so on. And one of the great ironies of, uh, of you know, dairy production and beef production is that there's significantly less methane produced when they're in a, a herd home, you know, which is such a in wonderfully inviting term that we use here, concentrated animal feeding operations. But is that what New Zealand really wants to do? You know, do we want to shatter that bucolic image of the cows grazing naturally and so we can lock them up in these, these filthy pens next to vast waste lagoons? That seems like such a huge step backwards to me. And something that is really going to undermine uh, the very, very important clean green image 
of New Zealand's brand worldwide, which impacts the tourism industry, which is another big sector of the economy, and impacts the export, uh, export into foreign markets where they really perceive the New Zealand brand on food and food products as being a stamp of quality uh, in China, for example. Um, and I, we think that that brand is critically important um, as, as, as growers and producers of food products ourselves here in New Zealand. We take advantage of that grand brand. We can quantify it in our, in our sales. Um, but this is going to be endangered. It's, in fact, it's being endangered by some of the other aspects of animal agriculture as well. Nutrient runoff from phosphates and nitrates and so on in the rivers and the lakes going out into the oceans and so on. So that clean green brand is something that we have to fight for. And a lot of our solutions to the emissions problem are also going to be co-solutions uh, when, when it comes to these other negative impacts of, of animal ag. So we can look, when I was working at the, the largest NGO in, in um, America, no one ever mentioned a word about animal agriculture. I was there for 10 years, but I learned all about the different environmental issues out there. Deforestation, biodiversity loss, polluted water, dying oceans, and climate change. And certainly these are all things that, that New Zealand is looking at and dealing with, but you can absolutely connect the dots to all of these things. There is an enormous amount of deforestation here, mostly for grazing. Um, the water is unfortunately getting polluted from the nitrogen runoff and from the slurry from the, the animals. Um, the dead zones that are created from the nitrogen runoff, and you, know, you always talk about how a lot of farmers are just growing algae because of the runoff that goes into the yeah. oceans. Uh, if you ask any farmer what they're growing, they'll say, you know, corn or flax or whatever they think they're growing, but what they're mostly growing is algae just somewhere else uh, right. because they're paying to put the inputs in the soil and it's leaching out or running off into the rivers and streams going down to the ocean and they're algae farmers. Right. They don't make any money off it though. So we have, we put plant-based diet in the middle, all of a sudden we have reforestation, we slow climate change, we clean up the oceans, we have fresh, safe water for all, and we protect biodiversity. I'm pushing the button. You're pushing it? I'm going? pushing it. I'm shaking it. Oh, wait a minute. Let the man push the button. <laughs> oh. oh, boom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, baby. Um, We're a team. <laughs> so when you're looking at um, moving from meat and dairy to more plants, so you use 18 times more land with, with animal products than you do versus plant products, 10 times more water, 9 times more fuel, 10 times more fertilizers and pesticides, and 20 times more emissions. If you think about the same area of land, call it a hectare, you can look at getting about 550 kilos from that piece of land. It sounds like a lot, but if you take the animals off of that land and you plant veggies, you can get 110,000 kilograms of veggies. So you can feed a lot more people and take care of the land, and take care of the air, and take care of the water. So we have six minutes, so. Yes, okay. We're, we're gonna kick into fifth gear now. Yes. So what did you do? Oh, here we go. Um, so you can just look at the, the land use for cow's milk versus plant-based milk. 0.36 square miles, 43 gallons of water use, and miles driven, 1.20 miles, this should be in kilometers. But the, you can see cashew milk is much, much less. Um, and you look at beef. Beef land use is 36 square miles, water use is 570. I mean, you can see, you can do the math and see that using a plant-based alternative like beans is a much better option. So I said earlier 
um, that we're number five in heart disease, number five in <laughs> diabetes, <laughs> number two in osteoporosis, and number one in bowel cancer. Every day, eight people are diagnosed with bowel cancer in New Zealand, and three of those people die. Now there's good news though, because by eating a plant-based diet, you have 43% less cancer, 24% less heart disease. It really is, it's good for the planet, it's good for your health, it's good for the economy, it's a win-win-win, and yes, it's good for your sex life too, because if you've got good blood flow in your body, you're gonna have it in all of your body. <laughs> Well, look, we could spend <laughs> all of our time and, and far more just talking about the health benefits. But, yes. but the question is, how does that impact the NZ economy, which has a huge export, 37% of export is, is uh, food and agricultural products. Well, whether, whether we can talk you guys into eating plant-based or more plant-based here today is really kind of irrelevant because the message is out there and it's happening and in Europe and, and, and North America and to a lesser extent, but, but accelerating rapidly in China, it's changing and it's changing in a very measurable way. And the single largest growth sector in the food industry, which is an industry that we work in, at least as much as, as the film industry for me, is uh, the, the plant-based uh, alternatives for meat, dairy, cheese, all that, all that sort of thing. So the point that we're driving toward here is that we, if, if the future is changing that direction, we need to be aware of it, we need to adjust to it, and regardless of our own internal national consumption here, we need to adjust to our international markets. So I'm gonna cruise through this. So in America, we've got 40% uh, dip in milk consumption, and the world actually, unfortunately, follows what the U.S. does, that's why there's so much heart disease and diabetes and, and disease around the world. Um. We should skip. I think, I think we've made this point yeah. about, yeah. okay, so, yeah. so hold that. Because, uh, hold on. All right. So, there's a 90-year-old dairy in the States, and they saw this trends happening and they shut down their 90-year-old dairy, and now they are 100% plant-based. They make all these different kinds of milks. They're, they're um, transitioning into yogurts and, and ice creams and things like that. It is the fastest growing sector in the food production. Alternative milks, here we go, alternative milks, with 1.7 billion last year, just in this past year. Beyond Burgers, maybe you all saw that in the news, surged 163% in their trading debut. Dannon invested $12.5 billion in dairy alternatives. Alternative milk, cheese, and dairy has been up 8% in the last year. Even the dairy icon Dean owns 70% of Good Karma Foods. $16 billion has been invested over the last 10 years in plant-based foods, and 13 of those 16 were just in 17 and 18. Right, so I think the message here is clear. This is a place where uh, New Zealand can lead because we're great innovators here. If we don't adapt to change, then we're gonna be like Kodak, okay? Kodak refused to accept that the world was gonna change away from film, and here we are 20 years later with all movies being made digitally, all television being made digitally, Kodak is long dead, and the movie industry's doing just fine. So that the, the key to it is, you know, uh, that the future is coming at you like a wave, coming at us like a wave, and we need to either surf that wave or uh, it's going to crash over our heads. So we had a whole thing on innovation and a celebration of the innovative spirit in New Zealand and I was going to talk a bit about Avatar and why we're here doing Avatar which is a, a very high-tech form of film production and how we make thousands of jobs in Wellington by attracting that capital to New Zealand and how successful those incentive programs have been. But I think I can sum that all up by saying the government has a role to play here 
in attracting capital and rewarding New Zealand uh, innovators and inventors and startup companies and so on with working in these sectors, whether it's new food products, whether it's uh, new ag technology that feeds into these new types of uh, alternative meat and dairy food products and, and, uh, and other things. Um, but innovation is a, is a, a key part of uh, how we're going to deal with this uh, transition seems like I don't it's think it's letting us. No, it's not. <laughs> no. Oh, okay, oh, there here we, we go. go. We're going to skip that one. Oh, you know what? It's I think it's the animation on the slide. So anyway, change, and change is inevitable. And will New Zealand lead or follow? Well, I think we know what's going to happen. I think we know that New Zealand is going to lead because that's the national spirit. We're great innovators here. We're inventive. And, uh, you know, uh, th this is a society that grew up very, very far from its parent culture at the antipode of the world and, and learned how to mm -hmm. fend for itself and solve problems. And it's a, it's a small country that, that's, that's tech forward and smart and we can pivot fast and we can, uh, we can take a leadership role and we can show the rest of the world what this, what this looks like. Okay. And I think we're going to... And you want to say one more thing? And Susie's going to say one more thing. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about big innovation, but I want all of you to know, as individuals, you can make a difference by changing one of your meals, just one. Eat whatever you want for breakfast or dinner, or, but changing one of your meals a day, one person for one year, save 740,000 liters of water, and 5,000 kilometers of driving. So that's like driving from the top of the North Island to the bottom of the South Island three times. We have about 500 people in the room. So if all of us decide to change one of our meals a day collectively, we can save 370 million liters of water and we can drive tip to tip. We save the carbon of 1,563 times. If the New Zealand population, 4.8 million, decided to choose to have one meal, change one meal a day, we would save 3 trillion gallons, 3 trillion, 552 billion gallons of water, liters of water, excuse me, and the carbon equivalent of driving tip to tip, 14 million, 400,000 times. So we are the grown-ups who have made a big mess, and it's up, up to us to clean it up for the future of our children. So together we can make a plan, we can be persistent, we can take action, and we can have fun to make the world a better place for our children to grow up in. She said it best. 